Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Scott Byer. I'm one of the founders and clinicians at Integrated Brain and Body, a clinic that is kind of in the Western Chicagoland area. And one of the things that I wanna to talk to you guys today about is a huge issue, uh, not only in the Chicagoland area, but in, in America in general, and that's blood glucose, okay? Now, if you're one who has things like fatigue, especially fatigue that hits like anywhere between noon and five o'clock or, or after lunch, you know, you get this really significant urge to, to nap like post meal fatigue or if you're one that's overweight or have tried everything like trying to cut weight and you just can't lose the weight or if you have things like sweet cravings things like brain fog issues with your mood maybe your cholesterol is a little bit high or you have high blood pressure there is a very 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 high probability that you have something called insulin resistance now the CDC actually just released some stats and they estimate around a hundred million Americans suffer from some form of things like insulin resistance, pre-diabetes or diabetes. Now here's the scary thing is a lot of times people will know if they have diabetes, but what's considered like this, this mechanism that has to occur before people to reach diabetes is something that's known as insulin resistance and prediabetes kind of falls in that spectrum. So here's the scary thing is that 88% of individuals that actually have prediabetes have no idea that they have it, okay? And yet if you're one who is um, struggling with some of these symptoms, you may wanna get that checked out. So what I wanna do today is kind of explain the mechanism as to why people with prediabetes um, or insulin resistance have issues with some of these things. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna erase the, um, the writing on the board and we'll get to it. Okay, so when it comes to our body, um, primarily there are two sources of fuel that our body uses. Um, the one that pretty much everybody's burning on here in America is glucose. The other one is something called ketone bodies. Um, but for the sake of understanding, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, glucose, okay? So if I ask you guys a question, when we eat food, what should happen to our blood glucose? Should it, go, should it go up or should it go down? And the answer to that, which I'm sure you guys have probably guessed, it goes up. It doesn't matter if you're 100% perfectly healthy, it doesn't matter if you're insulin resistant, prediabetes, or even diabetes. Every time you eat a meal, what should happen to your blood glucose is it should go up, okay? So every time we eat food, we should see a rise in our, our blood glucose, that's normal, okay? Now glucose, um, it being one of the primary sources of fuel, it's absolutely useless inside of the bloodstream. Um, it has to, get inside of, if this is like a cell right here, it has to get inside of the cell to where it can be utilized as a source of, of fuel for energy, okay? The example I always give is if you can imagine you were taking a road trip with your friends and you were out like in the middle of nowhere on the super long and straight road and all of a sudden the car's fuel gauge comes down to, to empty. Okay, car comes to a sputtering spot, sputtering stop. There's no gas stations for miles, but that's okay because in the in the back of the car there's these filled gas canisters of gasoline. Okay, well how come the car isn't running like how it should? It's because the the fuel is not inside of the fuel tank to where it belongs. It's the same thing with, with glucose inside of the blood, as glucose for the most part is useless inside of the bloodstream. It actually has to get inside of the cell to where it can be burned and utilized for energy. Okay, now there is a um, signaling molecule that helps do that, okay? And this signaling molecule, what it does is it will open the door to allow for glucose to get inside of the cell. Now what is this signaling molecule? Well that signaling molecule is insulin. So you better believe that chronic elevations of blood glucose, if our, so let me rewind myself. If insulin's main job is to take glucose inside of the blood, okay, and put it inside of the cell to where it belongs, if we have chronic elevations in blood glucose, What's gonna happen is since insulin's job is to take all this blood glucose and shove it inside of the cell to where it belongs, our body's gonna start secreting more insulin. And what happens with, with any type of signaling molecule or peptide or hormone is um, if, if hormones get too high for a long period of time, what will happen is the cells will start to kind of grow a little bit more resistant to that, 
that hormone, okay? And insulin is no exception. So if there's chronic elevations of insulin, what will happen is the cell just grows a little bit more resistant to that, okay? So it'll stop listening to insulin. Now, if, if insulin's main job is to open up the door and get glucose inside of the cell, and it's, it's not really exerting its most powerful effects on the cell because the cell's growing more insulin resistant, what will happen is glucose will bounce off of that cell. Okay, now before I tell you where it goes, if we can no longer get into gluc if we can no longer get glucose inside of the cell, what do you think happens to the energy production of that cell? Does it go up or does it go down? goes down. This is why one of the main um, symptoms that we see with insulin resistance or people with diabetes is fatigue. So the story doesn't stop there. You know, it, it generally decreases cellular energy. And what will happen is glucose bounces off the cell, gets sent to a different area of the body, and this area is, is our liver. Now the liver, what it will do is something interesting. It doesn't care how high blood glucose is, okay? It says, hey, if the cells don't need it right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take in all of this blood glucose and convert it into a storage form of future energy so that if we go through a, a period of starvation or if we go a long time without food, we'll have some a storage form of energy packed around our body so that we can burn that for energy. Now what do you think it, it creates? Is a future form of energy. Well, some of you guys might guess glycogen, and, and that's true, um, but the biggest thing that it will create or it will increase is the amount of fat production, okay? This is why, and I'm not just talking about things like um, adipose tissue or fat around the trunk or around the body, um, but this, what we typically see with people who are insulin resistant is an increase in not only fat around the body, but an increase in, in the production of certain fats and fatty acids. So we'll see like an, a really classic pattern on blood work. Um, not only will we see an increase in things like blood glucose, but we'll also see an increase in things like hemoglobin A1C, which is another good marker for blood glucose over time. And then if that occurs for so long, um, glucose will get sent to the liver and the liver produces fat, but it also produces things like cholesterol, which is considered a fat, okay? It also increases things like triglycerides. And then we'll see a classic pattern. We'll see really a, uh, uh, an increase in the bad cholesterol, which is LDL, and a decrease in the good cholesterol, which is HDL, okay? Now here's the thing is that this process right here, in order for your liver to take glucose and convert it into, into fat, that saps an individual of their energy. So if you've ever um, eaten like a huge youngest meal, like a gigantic meal, and then all of a sudden you want to uh, take a nap, you know, we've all experienced a little bit of this around Thanksgiving time. A lot of people think it's like the tryptophan from the turkey, you know, promoting sleep. Um, if that was true, we would get tired every time after we ate a banana, because bananas have like two to four times the amount of tryptophan than uh, servings of turkey does. The reason why people get tired post big meals or those with insulin resistance is that this process to take glucose and convert it into fat saps individuals of their energy. And that's one of the classic uh, symptoms that we see with individuals with insulin resistance is um, just post meal fatigue or generalized fatigue. Okay. Now, if this sounds like you, you're not alone. Like I said, CDC estimates around a hundred million Americans. That's one third of Americans have some degree of this. Now when this spirals out of control and it gets so bad, that's what we call type two diabetes, okay? And let me tell you, once you hit type two di diabetes, um, out or, or up goes like five prescription medications. And it's all like things like either insulin or metformin, You'll probably get put on a statin. You'll probably get put on, on a high blood pressure medication and then something like an antidepressant. Super common, like for someone to get diagnosed with diabetes, now, you know, next comes like five different medications, okay? The good news is that a lot of this can actually be reversed by watching some things in our diet. So if you guys found this interesting or if you have a family member who this sounds exactly like, don't be afraid to share the video. Like I said, if you wanted to work with one of the clinicians here, we're in the Chicagoland area. You can find out more either uh, by, by doing a Facebook search for Integrative Brain and Body or visiting our website, uh, the letter I, like integrative, and then brainandbody.com. I'm Dr. Scott Beyer. Hope you guys found this informative. You guys have a wonderful day.